Good morning. How you doing today? Good? It's good to be together. Hey, uh, last week, Wednesday evening, uh, the inaugural meeting of our One Thing Gathering, that was a fantastic time of praise and prayer and fellowship together. I am so encouraged by that time. Over 200 of you came out to seek the face of God together. Uh, Praise God, yes, praise God for such a fantastic start. Uh, My hope is that this gathering will continue to gather steam and be a source of refreshment and joy and power and renewal in the life of our church. Now, here the good news is, if you were unable to come last Wednesday evening, we're going to do this the third Wednesday of each and every month. We're going to do it until we die or until Jesus comes back. Uh, Whatever happens, this is just what we do. This is who we are. We want to see this worked into the life of our fellowship. We want to become a house of prayer. So if you are unable to come, put it on the calendar third Wednesday of each and every month. Well, last week as I was sharing with you a little bit about becoming a house of prayer, what seemed to resonate with many of you, uh, judging from your response, was our need for corporate renewal. There's a hardness and there's a crassness and there's a cynicism in our society that has even infiltrated the church. And I know it's not very nice to say, but I'm going to say it. Uh, Many of us struggle to have passion for the things of God. Uh, Many of us, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, rarely do we experience the joy of the Holy Spirit And we, the people of God, need need a refreshing movement of the Spirit of God among us so we can be renewed in our relationship with Him and one another. And many times in history, God has brought renewal. He's done it before, and He can certainly do it again. Throughout history, when the people of God have inwardly groaned, and long to see a change in the status quo in their lives, in the life of the church, God has brought revival. I think of the first great awakening. I think of the second great awakening, uh, the Welsh revival, or the Azusa outpouring in 1906 in Los Angeles, or the Jesus movement of the 1970s. God has brought revival before, and he certainly can bring it again. But here's the deal. There are certain terms of agreement that have to be met. Certain stipulations that are required of the people of God, requirements that we have to meet before we can experience a refreshing move of his spirit. It was just last week that an operating system for iOS 12 was released. And just as an aside, it was about 15 years ago that I finally gave up on the PC world and I became a Mac convert. And I tell you what, it was like being born again. Okay, it really was. All things became new, the old was gone, and the new came, and my life was changed forever. And just last week, as many of you know who have Apple devices, uh, they released iOS 12, and it seems to be, from what I can see, a pretty significant improvement. Uh, It's faster, it has a little bit better battery life, and some new helpful applications. But before installing the new software, what do you have to do? There's terms of agreement, right? Terms and conditions of agreement. You have to agree to the terms of agreement. And the terms of agreement is literally comprised of like 4,000 words of legalese that only a lawyer could understand. So what do most of us do? Most of us, we never read it. We just know the drill. We see that little box and we click on accept and we move forward. But here's the deal. You cannot experience the new operating system. You cannot experience this new arrangement, if you will, until you agree to the terms of agreement. And you know, it's the same way with God 
and revival. He's got his terms of agreement, certain conditions that have to be met, stipulations that have to be met by the people of God in order to open ourselves up to the possibility of a sovereign movement of his Holy Spirit to restore us to a place of repentance and faith and obedience. And here's the encouraging news. We all can understand God's terms of agreement. It's not 4,000 words of legalese, but rather it's 40 words of straight talk from the heart of God, from his heart to our hearts. So please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14, I think many of us are familiar with this great passage, but it's here that we see God's terms of agreement for revival to come requirements that the people of God must meet in every generation. Listen to these words. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, today I want to talk with you about revival on God's terms. In this passage, we see four conditions that must be met for revival to be experienced, for times of refreshing by the Spirit of God to come to the people of God. But before I dive into those four requirements, I want to make first a few general observations about this very famous passage of Scripture. Uh, First of all, the promise is for today. Okay, the promise is for today. There are some people who would say that this verse cannot be applied to the church today since the promise of divine healing and forgiveness was originally promised to who? To Israel. To Israel. But if you take a look closely at the verse, what does it say? It says, if my people... If my people who are called by my name, the fact that it says my people there, which is actually a technical phrase that's found throughout the Bible, the fact that it says my people opens up this promise to more than just the Jewish people. This phrase, my people, or God's people, is used throughout the Bible to describe anyone who is in relationship with God. For example, in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, Peter applies this Old Testament language to the New Testament church. He says, you are a people for his own possession. Who's the you? You, the church. You, the church, are a people for his own possession. And once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. And the apostle Paul tells us in Romans, for whatever was written in former days i.e., 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through the endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So you see, this promise of divine healing and forgiveness is not restricted to God's people at a certain time in history, but the principles that underlie this verse are applicable for the people of God in all generations. And that's really good news because we need it. Uh, Secondly, the promise is descriptive of current times. Okay, this promise is descriptive of current times, of the day and age in which we're living. If you look at the larger context of this promise, specifically verse 13, it implies that when national disasters begin to afflict a nation or people, it's time for us to wake up and to ask God what he's saying to us. Verse 13, God says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now, this is the context, and we cannot automatically assume that every disaster we experience in this life is directly from the hand of God. 
But when tragedies start coming in series, when we have a hard time turning on the evening news because it's a new insanity each and every day, then we need to think about it in the same way we think about it in the book of Amos. In the book of Amos, believers are told to sit up straight and to take notice. What did God do? God sent famine, then he sent drought, then he sent locusts, then he sent blight and mildew, and he sent plagues similar to what they experienced in Egypt. And finally, military defeat. But at the end of each and every one of these tragedies, the Lord says, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. This was the warning that God gave Solomon in 2 Chronicles 7, 13, that when you see this type of thing happening, then it's time to meet the condition of verse 14. Let me ask you, have the people of God, have our churches in America come to a similar point that we see in verse 13? Uh, Yes, the circumstances might be different. We don't have an invasion of locusts coming in that I'm aware of, right? But have, have we reached this point of verse 13? Let me ask you a question. Do we really need to ask that question? Do we really need to ask that question? You don't need the skills of a prophet to take a look at the current pace of evil and hardening in America to conclude that something is wrong. Something is very, very wrong. Just look at the evil present in our churches. It seems like each and every week there's a new scandal that rocks the church. Whether it's the Roman Catholic Church that's been in the news a lot lately, whether it's a pastor falling to immorality, it happens so often now, almost on a weekly basis, it's to the point where we hardly even think anything about it anymore. It's somewhat expected. It's somewhat routine. Look at the broken marriages and broken families, even within the church and among the people of God. Again, it's not nice to say, but look at how lethargic the people of God are, how clueless and uninformed in general they are concerning scriptural principles and the will of God for their lives, how they're absolutely captured by culture. It seems like we're being squeezed into culture's mold, how they have so genuine Uh, So little genuine passion and energy for the mission of God. Uh, Brothers and sisters, if there ever was a time for us to meet the condition of verse 14 and the principles that underlie this in our lives, in our church, in our nation, I would submit to you that it's now. A last general comment about this verse. The promise of deliverance is conditional. The promise of deliverance is conditional. What does verse 14 say? If, if, then, if my people, what? Humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their evil, then, then I will hear, forgive, and heal. If you will do this, God says, then I will do this. I will respond this way. And hear me very carefully, one of the most egregious errors in our day and age is that we have so stressed the love and grace of our Lord that we have virtually ignored the warnings and stipulations attached to participating in the promises of God. The condition, if then, is not for eternal life, but it is for maintenance and fellowship and communion with God and the enjoyment of life to the fullest in these bodies that we enjoy now on this earth. We're talking about our ability to enjoy God and to experience his presence and blessings. And the conditionality of this verse, just like many others, shows us that God will not bless a backslidden people who are mired in sin who are not taking these principles that are timeless principles seriously. The conditionality of if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways is no different from, is no more offensive than if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given. 
It's no different than if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And the conditionality of this verse has a lot to say to us. And it ought to seize our attention. Because I know it's not nice to say, but the reality is that many of us are walking around in a spiritual stupor. It shows up on our faces. You can see it. There's very little enjoyment of God. Very little spiritual power for so many of us. Jesus said that he would send the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power to live the Christian life, to be his witnesses. Uh, No encouraging progress in the Christian life for so many of us. Uh, for, For many of us, obedience isn't on the radar screen the way it needs to be. There's not a thirst for God the way there should be a thirst for God. If you live like this, it'll show up on your face. How how can it not? Well, why? Because so many of us have confused entering the Christian life with living the Christian life. Salvation is a free gift of God, but enjoying the blessings of fellowship and relationship and communion with God are very conditional upon obedience. Again, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And if this is where you find yourself this morning, then either you need to be genuinely born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, or you need to be revived and renewed, revived out of your backslidden state. So this is what we all need to know about the promise of 2 Chronicles 7, 14 that the principles, even though the particulars of the situation have changed a little, it was speaking to Israel, the principles that underlie it are the same today. We take a look in the New Testament. Does the New Testament talk about humbling ourselves? Yeah, James says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humbling ourselves, praying, seeking the face of God, repentance, all of those principles are found in the New Testament. So it does apply to today. I believe that it's very descriptive of the day and age we're living in, what we need. And the promise is conditional upon obedience. So with that by way of background, finally I'm ready to say to you what I want to say to you today. The four terms of agreement that we see in this passage are these. And we need to actively listen this morning. Okay? First, the first term of agreement is If my people humble themselves, if my people humble themselves, what does it mean to humble oneself? It means to bend the knee. It means to bow the knee in submission. It means that the people of God render to him complete and total voluntary subjection to him and his will. It means we deny every impulse to exalt ourselves following the pattern of the culture that we live in. There are two revivals recorded in Second Chronicles, which are meant to show us what this condition of humbling ourselves looks like. Both King Rehoboam and King Josiah had to come to the point of saying, God, unless you extricate us from this trouble we're in, we have absolutely no hope. God, we need you. No one Nothing else will be able to help us. That's why King Josiah, maybe you know the story, he came down off his throne, he got down on his knees, and he put his face to the ground. He humbled himself when he heard the reading of the word of God. He said, oh God, you're the only one that can help us. I'm on my knees, on my face before you now because my heart is cut to the quick. And this is the point that we need to come to as well, individually and corporately. And until we realize just how disobedient we've been, how unhumble we've been, we won't won't come down off this throne of self. Again, it's not very nice to say, and I have a lot of things today that are not very nice to say. But the truth is that many of us outside of just about an hour on Sundays, are living for self. The ultimate commitment we have when push comes to shove is self. 
what's convenient for me, what fits into my life and my schedule. And it's like the kingdom of God is a bolt onto the edge of all of our other activities rather than being the very center. We have to see where we're sick and we have to humble ourselves and own up to it because God is the only one who can extricate us from this quicksand of lukewarmness and self-centeredness and a backslidden state. It was the great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon when he was sharing with his people, he said, if King Josiah came down off his throne onto his knees and humbled himself, then how dare we stand? These principles are true today. The second term of agreement is this, if my people pray, if my people pray, and this prayer term here isn't primarily talking about our personal, private, devotional lives of prayer. It's speaking about God's people coming together to plead for the strong hand of God to dramatically intervene in the things of life that matter most. Loving God, Lord, help us to love you with all of our hearts. Loving others as we love ourselves. Making disciples of all nations. It's speaking of God's people coming together, realizing that we are not living in peacetime, but we are caught in the midst of a great spiritual conflict, a conflict of kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. This is the type of prayer that says, God, we realize that the proper goals for life and ministry are a above and beyond our ability to reach in our own power. Lord, we can't do it without you and your help, and we want our lives to be about your purposes and your goals, and you're the only one who can work these things in our lives. And we won't let you go until you change us and until you change this situation. If the church is to be a house of prayer, and according to Jesus it is to be a house of prayer, then prayer and petition and supplication need to be the atmosphere of that house, need to be the fragrance of the house. If it's not the atmosphere of our church, if this is not the means by which God's work moves forward, then we have to be content with being soundly thrashed by the current world system in our families, in our churches, in our schools, and in our government. If God's people aren't gathering together to pray, then the only thing we can count on with certainty is a continued drift into lethargy and the forces of evil having a field day in our culture. And I would submit to you that we are there. Alexander White in his book on prayer says, My brethren, will nothing teach you to pray? Will all his examples and all his promises and all your needs and cares and distress not teach you to pray? Will you not tell your Savior what a dislike, even downright antipathy you have for prayer, how little you attempt it and how soon you're wary of it? Then he says, only pray, O oh, you prayerless people of his, and heaven will soon be open to you also, and you will hear the Father's voice, and the Holy Ghost will descend upon you like a dove. You know, over the last couple of months, I have been working on a healthier Jeff Daly. And you know what I've discovered in my life? Hopefully you're seeing less and less of me. Did I disappear? Yeah, thank you. Well, but, but you know what I've discovered? And I, I've known this for a long time, but I have discovered that there, there are no shortcuts. There's not a pill for it. Uh, there probably is a pill for it, but there's not a pill for it that I want to take. And the most basic requirement that must be met in my life is this, exercise more and eat less. It's the most basic requirement. And I'm asking you, would you pray for me? I've been able to get to this place before, but I'd like to be able to maintain it and not have it 
creep back on, but I have to tell you, at times the attitude of my heart toward this eat less and exercise more has been, no, I hate it. Anything but that. Anything but that. Don't tell me to eat less and exercise more. I'll do anything but that. And you know, I think it's the same in our spiritual lives. We have to come to an end of ourselves, of all of our attempts to fix our problems apart from prayer. Prayer is a condition that has to be met out of love for our Lord and devotion to Him. It has to be met if we're going to be fruitful and enjoy life with Him. And here's the deal. We are not going to preach our way out of it. We are not going to be able to program our way out of it as a church. We're not going to be able to staff our way out of it as a church. There's no way to get around this condition of prayer. So the the question becomes, are we desperate enough? Are we hungry enough for it? Uh, Do do we see what's happening in our churches and in culture around us? Are are we hungry enough for it? You know, I am so excited about what happened last Wednesday night, but if I'm being transparent with you, last Wednesday night was great, but what's going to happen two months from now? What's going to happen three months from now? What's going to happen a year from now? My prayer is that God would move upon our hearts as we gather together to pray and that we would be encouraged by his presence, and we would genuinely grow into a house of prayer. But that's quite honestly the question here in America, the fruited plain, where we have so much, so many things to distract us. Are we hungry enough? Are we desperate enough to become a house of prayer? Now, the third agreement that needs to be met, the third term of agreement is this, if my people will seek my face. What the face of God signifies here is the joy and the presence and the approval of the Lord. When we learn to love God for who he is and not just what he can do for us, then we're in a position to truly know him. When we can learn to love the God, love God, love the master for who he is and not just what's on his table, because he has some wonderful things on his table, But if we learn to love him for who he is, then we are in a position to truly know him. God needs to be more than the means by which we get things done. Yes, we need the hand of God in our church and in our lives, but more than the hand of God, we need the face of God. Daniel Henderson, in his book, Transforming Prayer, puts it like this. If all we ever do is seek God's hand... We may miss his face, but if we seek his face, he will be glad to open his hand and satisfy the deepest desire of our hearts. We need the face of God. In other words, one of the most basic requirements that needs to be met for revival and refreshment from his spirit to come is that we need to seek his face. We have to love him for who he is, pursue relationship with him, And what better way to show him that we're serious about that, that we want that, than by gathering together to say, Lord, even if we have everything, but we don't have you, then we don't have anything. Like I said, I'm encouraged. We're off to a great start, but I want to see this grow in prominence, grow in vitality, grow in importance and priority in our lives and in our fellowship. Now, the fourth and last term of agreement is this, if my people will turn from their wicked ways. Uh, Repentance. If there's no turning from sin, the sin of our willfulness and self-sufficiency, then our desire for revival and refreshment has to be doubted. And here's the deal. It's not very nice to say, but repentance isn't repentance until you've changed. Repentance isn't repentance until we've changed. Repentance is more than just intellectual assent, agreeing with God that, yeah, God, you're you're right. Repentance is not only a change of mind, but it's a change of heart, and it's a change of direction. 
And this is just isn't an Old Testament thing. The Apostle Paul says, everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn from wickedness. It's not just a change of mind, it's a change of direction. It's not just thinking something different, it's doing something different. In order for revival to come, we need to get rid, just like the people of God in all ages, we need to get rid of our idols. Our idols, and they are many. Excessive recreational pursuits. We live in Colorado. The love of money, the love of possessions, a fear of loss, people pleasing, comfort seeking, entertainment addiction, thirst for power, seeking after control, uh, the desire for inappropriate sexual gratification. The Spirit of God will not bless his people, will not fall on us in a refreshing movement if the people of God are cherishing their sin and nursing their sins and hanging on to their sins and making excuses for their sins. No matter what the sin may be, Jesus says that the solution is always the same. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. So these are God's conditions for revival. Humble ourselves. Pray. Seek his face. And repent and turn. If God's conditions are met, then what does the text say? That he will hear and forgive and heal. If you do this, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Another word for revival. The Holy Spirit falling like gentle rain to refresh his people. As the book of Amos says, the breaking up of fallow ground. Or the prophet Isaiah, wildflowers bursting forth in the wilderness, in the desert. Or as Peter says in Acts of the Apostles, times of refreshing from the Lord and how we need it, how we need it. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. It happened during the days of King Asa of Judah. Now, the book of Second Chronicles is a book about revival, about the different revivals that have taken place among the people of God, among the different kings. It happened during the days of King Asa of Judah. The people humbled themselves, they prayed, they sought the face of God and they repented of their sins. They put away their idols and the result is this. And all of Judah rejoiced for they had sought him with their whole desire and he was found by them. Isn't that beautiful? It happened during the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, the most extensive revival recorded in scripture. It takes several chapters. It's more detailed in its description than any other revival recorded in the Bible. During the days of Hezekiah, it happened. Why? Because the people humbled themselves. They prayed, they sought the face of God, and they repented of their sins, and they put away their idols. And it says, so there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there has been nothing like this in Jerusalem. Then the priests and the Levites arose and they blessed the people, and their voice was heard and their prayer came to his holy habitation in heaven. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Uh, Pastor Chuck Smith, many consider him to be the, the leader or the father of the Jesus movement. He died, I think, in 2013, 2014. The man just radiated the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you ever saw him teach, if you know anything about Pastor Chuck, but He's often called the father of the Jesus movement, a revival that came to Southern California during the 70s, mostly among hippies. 
and it took off from there and it spread all over to the point where it's exerted influence even to this day around the United States and around the world. Chuck Smith was asked, do you think the church will ever see another revival like the Jesus movement? And Chuck Smith said, I don't know if we're desperate enough. Maybe if we're desperate enough to pray, we'll see another. And then he said this, if we want to see revival, then we have to do revival-like things. If we want to see revival, we have to do revival-like things. The key verse in 2 Chronicles is 2 Chronicles 7.14. It forms an outline for the entire book, and then we have examples of revivals flowing out of that verse and how all of these elements, these four terms of agreement, are met in these different revivals. If we, the people of God here in the United States, if Southern Gables Church wants to see a refreshing movement of his spirit, what do we need to do? Humble ourselves. Pray, seek his face, and put away our idols. Why? Because these are God's terms of agreement. He's brought revival before, and he can do it again. Now, I'm going to ask you, if you're able to, if you're able to uh, bow yourself before God and come out of your chair and kneel, I'm going to encourage you to do that. But if you can't come to God on your physical knees... Come to him on the knees of your heart and let's take a moment to come to our Lord in prayer and bow our souls before him. Our Father in heaven, you graciously promise your people in all ages, that if we will humble ourselves, if we will pray, if we will seek your face and turn from evil, that you will hear, that you will forgive, and that you will heal. Holy Father, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You have been our help in ages past. And we need your help today because, our Lord, we have been captured by comfort and compromised by complacency. For so many of us, culture has been more influential than Christ. And we're assaulted daily by the lies of consumerism and self-actualization that tell us that the kingdom is all about us and having happy lives and having good lives rather than you and your glory. Forgive us, our Lord, for the ways that we have made it about us. And God, we're distracted by so many things, so much entertainment, so many hobbies and recreations and pursuits. And Lord, we freely admit that you're the only one who can rescue us from this spiritual malaise that is over the church in America and that is over many of our lives. So please, Abba Father, forgive us our sins and rescue us. There's no other way. And gracious Father, forgive us for seeking your hand without first seeking your face. May you not just what's on your table. May you become our truest and deepest source of happiness. And forgive us for treating prayer like a peacetime intercom. Uh, to call in more comforts rather than a wartime walkie-talkie to engage in the spiritual battle and to see the borders of your kingdom expanded. Our Father, open our eyes to the reality of a spiritual battle raging around us, kingdoms in conflict, and teach us to boldly come before your throne of grace for the things that matter most in life, loving you, loving others, 
and making disciples of all nations. Father, we are so excited and we thank you for the great start to one thing last week. We ask that it could grow in vitality and participation, that we would genuinely become a house of prayer, that it would just be part of our DNA, Father. Forgiving Father, search us and bring to our attention sins that need to be renounced. Give us the power by your Spirit to overcome. And give us, God, the courage to act decisively. And for those of us who are battling compulsions and addictions, where the desire is there, but we're ensnared and we don't know how to break loose, would you look into our hearts and see that desire that we have to change and help us with all of your divine power and resources. Lord, help us by the Spirit. Please bring the right people, the right counsel, the right wisdom, the right accountability into our lives that we might be free. And may we all be pure, clean, sharp, usable instruments in your hands. Merciful Father, hear us from heaven and forgive us our sins. Heal our lives. Heal our nation. Heal our world. Heal our church. Would you please delight us with your presence and pour out your Holy Spirit of joy on us as we seek your face. And God, could our church become a house of prayer? where there is a sweet fragrance of praise and supplication and intercession combined with holiness and love and laughter. Would you shine your face upon us and be gracious to us that we might live in the fullness of all the blessings that Christ died and rose to bring us. Our God, we love you, and our prayer is that you fully, Abba Father, would become our one thing. We pray all this today to you, our loving and good Lord, in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said together, amen.